episode of season nine of the dark money files in which we shine a light into a murky world i am ray blake and with me is my co-host friend and business partner graham barrow hello graham hello ray it's time to talk tax graham oh yes ray and and given your very fine alliteration i feel we're gonna have to nail this one oh better than your punning graham it has to be said (laughs) um yeah, that wasn't an especially good one, was it? Uh, shall we just move on? I think that would be best, yeah. Mm. Uh, I mean, here we are approaching 100 episodes and we haven't addressed tax evasion yet. Well, you know, May, it is a tricky subject, not not least because mm. there just isn't a hard border between avoidance, aggressive avoidance and evasion. Which means that the perfect place to start is to try and provide some sort of definition for each of those three terms. Well, do you know, I agree. So shall we start at the beginning with tax avoidance? Yeah. One definition that's generally accepted is legally exploiting the tax system to reduce tax liabilities. Yes, and these schemes are often put into three different categories. And mm-hmm. that is postponement of taxes, arbitrage across individuals and arbitrage across different income streams and let's look at those in turn well i think that's a good idea i mean i think postponement of taxes is is quite straightforward if a Mm. tax bill in the future will be lower than a tax bill today Mm. using schemes that will effectively postpone the requirement to pay the tax until the rate is lower is just a sensible option providing that it does not unduly inconvenience you in the meantime And that might be something like phasing the sale of capital assets across one or more years to ensure full use of capital tax allowances, or delaying the sale of a property because tax reduction has been announced for the forthcoming tax year. Yeah, so let's move on to the the next bit then. Okay, Um, so we could talk about arbitrage across individuals next. If you have two or more individuals, let's say a husband and wife working in a company, and one has other income that takes them into a higher tax bracket, you might have salary arrangements where the one in the lower tax bracket gets a larger income to benefit from the lower tax rate. Yeah, and and then you might just argue that's the point where what is legal starts to blur with what is morally acceptable. Mm, As in the case where the work's done equally, but the rewards aren't applied in the same way solely to game the system. Yes, and that might be, for example, spreading your income within a company across both dividends and uh, salary. Or Mm -hmm. it it might be if the capital taxes are lower than the income taxes, you might make arrangements to convert some of your income to capital to ensure it's taxed at a lower rate. Yeah, there's a degree of artificiality there, isn't there? Exactly. Okay. So look, there's a very good, if somewhat dated, paper on this subject by a chap called Joseph Stiglitz, entitled The General Theory of Tax Avoidance, which is freely available to download from the internet and just as relevant today, I think, as when it was published in 1986. 1986. Mm. You were still a teenager then, weren't you? Well, just about, Graham. You weren't, of course. <laughs> well, thank- <laughs> thanks for reminding me, mate. I think I had two kids and a divorce by, by then. Well, yeah, mm. absolutely. Moving on, though, mm. uh, we should talk about um, aggressive tax avoidance next. Yeah, now, <clears throat> it's actually hard to find a, a, a universally accepted definition. But if we said that aggressive tax avoidance usually comprises of the formation of artificial schemes solely designed to bend the will of the legislative body which created the legislation in the first place, we wouldn't be far off. Okay, so legally okay, but morally wrong. Yes, and that throws up all sorts of issues. For example, playing devil's advocate, Hmm. if I'm not breaking the law, what's the problem? Yes, exactly. HMRC, so Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs here in the UK, have produced a handy little two-pager, which is called Tackling Tax Avoidance. And that's very helpful in this respect. 
Yeah, and you know, whenever anyone says Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, or even I see it written down in full, I feel the need to stand up. <laughs> um, <laughs> but this, this little two-pager talks about using tax release for purposes for which they were not intended. It talks about, and I'm quoting here, contrived artificial transactions that serve little or no purpose. But... But, but mm. if it is legal, how do you decide whether it falls into that aggressive category? Oh, dotas, Graham. Do, do, dotas. <laughs> I think dotas. I'm, I'm in my dotas, aren't I? Well, there is that. <laughs> uh, but I'm talking about uh, a, a list of schemes published by HMRC here in the UK um, that, that set out a number of rules, which is called dotas. And that stands for? The Disclosure of Tax Avoidance Schemes Rules. So, so are you saying that you can put together a scheme solely designed to avoid tax and then get it approved by HMRC? In fact, there are three categories of, of disclosures, Graham. There's the VAT disclosure regime, uh, VAT, Value Added Tax, mm. or VADR. The VAT and Other Indirect Taxes Scheme, or DASVOIT. D-A-S-V-O-I-T, which doesn't sound terribly English, does it? No. Um, and DOTAS, which covers other taxes and the apprenticeship levy. Oh, when you said mm. DAS for it, I, had a, I could imagine Midnight Cowboy in Germany and people saying, ah, oh, DAS for it. Is the... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's a really obscure joke. I, I apologise. Uh, um, obscure, but absolutely delicious. Thank you. Um that last sentence sounds almost like it needs an episode all to itself. Well, possibly, but 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 I mean, it's a minority interest, frankly. Uh, and, and those who are interested might be better off just going to the HMRC website and read it, reading it for themselves. Uh, um, you know, seeing if they can get a life while they're there. Yeah, I, I mean, a minority <laughs> interest for what is already a minority interest podcast. Yeah. It is, yeah. Mm. So. Uh, Hard demographic to make a business plan from. Oh, yes, I think you're probably <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> returning to the subject in hand. Mm. So, so, Ray, what is the benefit of registering under these schemes? Well, for one thing, Graham, they give you a nice scheme registration number. Oh, nice. Does that mean that HMRC have now approved your arrangement? Yeah, well, not as such, oh, no. Oh. Uh, it just means that you've disclosed it properly under the requirements of the relevant legislation. And there's a host of penalties for non-compliance. But does that mean it won't be then investigated? Well, no, Graham, it doesn't. Oh. It just means that the scheme must be disclosed to the employer and any other affected personnel. And trying to operate a scheme outside of DOTAS or one of the other disclosure regimes isn't a good idea because the penalties could end up even higher due to the failure to disclose rules. Well, this is all very interesting. Ray, and mm. I have to be honest, not something I knew very much about before this episode. Um, so is there any way of finding out if HMRC are investigating any of these schemes directly? There is. Ooh. HMRC has published an online information booklet called Spotlight, uh, which highlights schemes currently under investigation and shares its name with a book of uh, actors as well. It does, and, and it, you could mm. almost say it's, it's trying to shine a light into a murky world um uh, well i think that's actionable frankly <laughs> well, i think we probably claim intellectual property rights over that now I think um, so. but that is nevertheless that is it is genuinely fascinating um yeah now before we go any further i think we should also talk about tax evasion well, yeah, and on the surface, this is much more straightforward because it covers any criminal conduct which involves individuals or businesses paying too little tax or wrongly claiming tax repayments by acting wrongly or dishonestly. OK, so this isn't about bending the rules then. It is actually about breaking them. Uh, yes, and like many things in life, sometimes it can be quite hard to determine the point at which bending turns to breaking. Hmm. Uh, and and let's be honest, there are often people who are willing to take that gamble because the savings mm -hmm. can be, frankly, enormous. 
Yes, they can. And the difficulty for practitioners is that the more money people have, the more it seems likely they will take that gamble. And therefore, the harder it is to make the call because getting it wrong can be expensive. Except maybe for the lawyers who, who do tend to win either way. I, you're not going to take me down that path, Graham. <laughs> I think that's probably the right approach, Ray, because we do not have a fighting fund for litigation handy, do we? Mm. So let's talk about mini umbrella companies instead. Well, yes, let's. But we probably need to start off defining, first of all, an umbrella company before we move mm -hmm. on to their rather more problematic little sibling. OK, now HMRC say, and again I'm quoting, that an umbrella company is a company that employs a temporary worker, an agency worker or contractor, often on behalf of an employment agency. The agency, it goes on, will then provide the services of the worker to their clients. OK, and the advantages of that are? Well, again, according to HMRC, if you are employed by an umbrella company, the tax rules on agency workers and off-payroll working, IR35, will not apply to you. OK, and if I'm right, that means you avoid the possibility of being treated as an employee of the company which is using you on a temporary or contract basis, uh, which could have tax disadvantages both for the company and for you as the worker. Exactly, Graham. And we need to say that these are a completely legitimate way of making suitable tax arrangements if you perform interim or contract assignments. Yes. Good. And a mini umbrella company? Hmm. Well, let's go back to HMRC, who say there is no standard mini umbrella company fraud model and arrangements are constantly evolving as organised criminals try to hide their fraudulent activities from HMRC. But it doesn't actually define what a mini umbrella company is. So that's not entirely helpful, is it? Uh, no, from that point of view, it isn't. But they do go on to add, quotes, these criminals create multiple limited companies and only a small number of temporary workers are employed by each one. There you go. Um, mm. They are set up, it adds, to enable fraud. Ah, oh, now that is interesting as it instantly signposts the possibility <coughs> of tracking them through company formations. Now, I thought that would make you sit up and take notice. Uh, and there are further additions to the definition which are also going to interest you. Uh, again, let me quote. The structuring of the mini umbrella companies is facilitated by a promoter business, sometimes also known as an outsourcing business, which may have other linked businesses to support the operation. The creation of the mini umbrella companies and the complex layers of businesses within the supply chain help to facilitate the fraud. Well, you were quite right. That did make me sit up and take notice. Mm. Um, although it will come as no surprise to our listeners to know that we have, in reality, been tracking mini umbrella companies, or mucks, for some little while. Do you mean to say, Graham, that this entire conversation was a conceit to help explain how mucks work for the benefit of our listeners? Um, Ray, that has been the whole basis of this podcast since its inception. It, it, what a it, reveal. It shouldn't come as a <laughs> surprise in episode 99. Well, that's fair. <laughs> um, we haven't yet explained the advantages of a muck. You are right. So, they are formed primarily to abuse two specific government incentives designed to help small businesses. Mm. One is the flat rate VAT scheme and the other is the employment allowance. But these schemes can also result in non-payment of other taxes, such as PAYE, national insurance and standard rate VAT. So, Ray, to begin with, would you like to explain what the flat rate VAT scheme is? I'd like nothing more, Graham. I so. um, the flat rate VAT scheme is available to companies with a turnover of less than £150,000. Essentially, the company pays a fixed rate of VAT to HM Revenue and Customs, and is allowed to keep the difference between what it charges and that agreed amount. Very nice. And the employment allowance is available to small businesses with national insurance liabilities below £100,000 per annum, and it can result in a national insurance annual reduction of up to £5,000. And this is where the muck 
comes in the mini umbrella company (laughs) well yeah um suppose you've been tasked to provide say a hundred contract workers to a particular company contracting them all under one umbrella company is perfectly legal and acceptable as it makes the contract easy to manage and it's fully transparent yes but supposing notwithstanding that the contract's been awarded to one contracting company they invoice from a large number of smaller companies which have been set up solely to utilise flat rate VAT and employment allowance benefits. Now, in that case, HMRC regards that as a mini umbrella fraud and they really don't like it. No, no, they they really don't. But before we talk about what they're currently doing about it, maybe we should explain how these mucks work in practice. Uh, Yes, although we should tread carefully, bearing in mind the lack of um, that litigation fund, as you've previously noted, Graham. So I agree with all of that, Ray. So let's explain the process, (laughs) but let's not name any names, maybe. Okay. So the process kicks off by recruiting ordinary folks to allow their names to be used as the directors and owners of newly formed companies. Okay. so how do they find them, Ray? Well, they find these people through Facebook mainly, Graham. They offer people uh, £50 or £75 a company to complete all the paperwork and return it on their behalf to Company's House. Um, But of course, they are now on the register, which can have all sorts of longer term impacts. Yeah, there are some registers you really don't want to be on. Um, Sadly, the people who are mainly targeted are vulnerable usually because they're low-income families for whom that extra money is extremely helpful and who, by and large, will have little understanding of the impact of being a director or a person with significant control. OK, and is that it? Well, no. The UK folks who are recruited in this way usually act for up to six companies at a time, But then after a few weeks, the roles of director and PSC are transferred over to a Filipino who is only ever allowed one company. Okay, why Filipinos? Well, firstly, because they're outside the jurisdiction, which makes it harder to prosecute should HMRC decide to do so. And secondly, because there's a high incidence of low income people who are happy to take the role of director of a UK company for a few pounds. Oh, and do we know how many companies fall into this particular muck network? We do, Graham. Uh, A BBC investigation last May uncovered at least 48,000. 48,000? Oh, yes. And as you know, they continue to be added at the rate of hundreds every week. It's probably gone past 60,000 by now. Surely HMRC aren't just standing idly by. Well, no, they've started deregistering a whole host of companies from the flat rate VAT scheme. I bet that hasn't proved to be very popular. Well, no. And there's a variety of court cases either ongoing or threatened, but that's moving outside the scope of the podcast. And are these the only people, Ray, running these mini umbrella companies? Oh, not at all, Graham. We're finding new networks almost every week. There was one shut down in Birmingham last year, but not before more than £100 million had gone through the books. Oh, so, so it looks like it's quite lucrative then. Well, let me put it this way. One of the people cited in that article was driving around in a McLaren F1. Oh, that's nice. Mm. And the main protagonists had upwards of £15 million in their accounts frozen. Oh, very nice. And the estimated loss of tax was around £17 million. That is not nice. Uh, No. The report says that it provided payroll services to around 6,500 people. OK, but think about this. The network we just spoke about involving the Filipinos is likely to involve around 60,000 companies over the past few years. Oh, you're right, Graham. And if each of those companies acts on behalf of, say, five people in order to keep the turnover low enough to qualify for the benefits, that still represents around 300,000 people on their books. So... At the same rate of tax saving, and we don't know mm. if this is true or not, but but still, let's have a go. That represents about 18 times the amount that the Birmingham network accounted for. 
or to put it another way, around £1.8 billion lost tax revenue. I do hope we've got our sums wrong. Mm, uh, so do I, Graham. So do I. And and there we have it. It's a scheme that sits right on the cusp between legal and illegal. Mm, HMRC clearly calls it out as fraud, but as I understand, they're likely to have to defend that position in the courts. I only hope they win, Ray. The, the rules were clearly never intended to be circumvented in that way. Well, if this is proven to be fraudulent tax evasion, and I'm fairly confident it will be, um, there will be ripple effects into the AML space. Providing financial services for these firms will constitute money laundering, both now and in the past, presumably. Well, yes, and, and I wonder whether HMRC and the court won't fancy using their new powers under the Criminal Finances Act and bringing criminal corporate charges against banks and payment firms who have failed to prevent the facilitation of tax evasion. Mm. Let's not forget that thousands of people have had or continue to have their names on company registrations without a clue as to what that means, or indeed having proper ownership of that company. It's a scandal of rather epic proportions. And one that continues today and beyond by the looks of it. Well, yes, Ray, and in the two weeks prior to us recording this episode, because I've just checked, a further 740 of these mucks were added to the UK register. Do you know, I fancy this is another story we may well come back to. But mm. in the meantime, we need to look ahead. So maybe next time we should look at the recent FCA call for evidence in relation to synthetic data. Yes, and the call may be from the UK regulator specifically, but the impact of synthetic data will be felt worldwide. And if our understanding is correct, it will be felt in a very positive way. Yes, and as far as recording the next episode is concerned, I'm looking forward to it. Well, considering that was tax evasion, it was actually quite a lot of fun to do, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, everyone loves a villain, I suppose. But but until you stop and think that actually we're subsidising them. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, the villains in, in the world of tax are not quite so clear cut as they are in the world of corruption or organised crime, are they? No, no, no. I think you're, you're right. There's a there's often a perceived Robin Hood element to this, isn't there even? Well, yes, and it's only just really occurred to me that because the thing about tax evasion is that there isn't any underlying predicate crime. It's the evasion that is the crime, which is a bit different from money laundering. And no, such. absolutely right. Absolutely right. It's one of those irregular verbs, isn't it? Um, I take sensible precautions. You evade tax. He's a scrounger. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. Got it in one. I'm not even going to try him. <laughs> Let's, I'll just leave that hanging there. It's perfect. Splendid. All right. Well, uh, next time's going to be fun. I, I, we're big advocates of synthetic data, and I can't wait to get stuck into that. I'm, I'm with you on that, Ray. So maybe we should synthesise the podcast. Ooh, very good. All right. Bye, everyone.